Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this ISM Trust webinar about discrimination in the music sector. The ISM Trust is the ISM's sister charity, offering high quality professional development to everyone working in music. Through the ISM Trust, the ISM gives back to the music sector and supports and empowers music professionals to succeed. My name's Ruth McPherson. I'm Head of Charity Development here at the ISM. And in today's session, I'll be joined first by our Chief Executive, Deborah Annettes, who will introduce our webinar, and then by our President, Vic Bain, founder of the F List, and our Research and Policy Officer in Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Catherine Williams. And the, uh, Vic and Catherine are the authors of our latest report, Dignity at Work 2, Discrimination in the Music Sector. Following that, my legal colleague, Neris Owen, the ISM's senior legal advisor, will explain what you need to know about the law in relation to discrimination, harassment and bullying, and what rights you have in this area. Now, before we begin, just a few points of housekeeping. During the presentations, please do feel free to ask questions using the Q&A function, and we'll do our best to answer these at the end of the webinar. Please also keep an eye on the chat box where we'll be dropping in some useful links as we go. And if you experience any technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat box and we'll attempt to resolve these. And if you wish to use subtitles, they're available by enabling them at the bottom of your screen. The webinar is being recorded and it will be available to watch back in a few days time via the ISM Trust's website at ismtrust.org forward slash webinars. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to hand over to Deborah Annette, the ISM CEO, to introduce and chair today's webinar. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much, Ruth, and welcome to everybody who has signed up for this incredibly important webinar. Um, we are going to be talking about some really difficult, tough stuff this afternoon. And some of you may find some of the evidence and the findings um, that we researched quite difficult. So totally understand that this is not going to be necessarily an easy session to take part in, but it's a very important session. Everybody who works in the music sector deserves a safe workplace. And ISM since 1882, has been campaigning really to make sure that the interests of musicians are protected and supported and that music is promoted. And part of this means that people should be able to work without fear that they may be subjected to some kind of discrimination, bullying or harassment. So that's what we're going to be looking at this afternoon. Now, the ISM itself is a not-for-profit, um, it provides legal services to its um, over 11,000 members. We also do a huge range of insurances, professional development, uh, career support, etc. But we also have two charities. And as Ruth said, ISM Trust is all about giving back to the music sector. And it's through the ISM Trust that we do most of our professional development. So this afternoon, you're going to be actually hearing about the work of the ISM, but it's being delivered by the charity, the ISM Trust. Our other charity is the ISM Benevolent Fund, which offers a range of other types of support to the ISM membership. So it's incredibly important to the ISM that people can work in a, in a confident way in their workforce. The report that we produced just a couple of weeks ago was a follow on report to 2018 and the work that we did back then. And I don't know if people remember, but at the time back in 2017, uh, the scandal surrounding Harvey Weinstein was coming to a fore and the ISM was contacted by ISM members saying, can I share with you what has happened to me? in my workplace. And as a result of that, we uh, undertook some research, uh, which led to the first Dignity at Work uh, report, followed by Dignity in Study. That then led on to the ISM code with the MU and a huge amount of work that we have been doing in relation to lobbying to change various parts of the structures that underpin uh, the legislation around discrimination. So it's a complicated world 
that we're about to enter. But I am incredibly proud of the work that Catherine and Vic have done. We're very lucky to have Vic as the chair of the organisation, the Independent Society of Musicians. She's an incredibly experienced uh, person in this uh, field, and she's also now developing her expertise through the academic route. Uh, she is the founder of the F List, and uh, she's also the former CEO of Basco, so she absolutely knows what she's talking about. Uh, with us, we also have Catherine Williams, who's been working with the ISM in a research capacity since about 2020, uh, when she started working with us uh, in relation to research around COVID. Um, an absolutely brilliant researcher. So we're very lucky to have uh, these two, Catherine and Vic, talking, taking us through the report. And then Neris, who is an in-house solicitor with us, specialising in employment law, will be able to take us through some of the, the nitty gritty of employment rights. So without further ado, can I hand over to you, Catherine? Yes, thank you, Deborah. I'm really pleased to be here as the research and policy officer for the ISM, a proper role that I started in March this year, um, having done some COVID research during, well, during 2020-21. Um, I'm really proud to be a co-author of this report with Vic. So first, for a bit, a little bit of background, I, alongside being a researcher, I've also worked as a freelance flute player for the past 10 years. Um, and I'm active as a recording artist, soloist, teacher, and orchestral player. Ten years ago, when I started, I was a much younger, lone parent when I started to build up my professional music career. So I've known about the difficult juggling roles well from the very start. When Deborah told me that my first project for this, for this role would be to revisit their dignity at work research, it was initially a bit daunting, as it essentially meant that I would be investigating the workplace that I'd been in for the past decade. But throughout this research project, there have been many things that I learned that I wish that I had known when I was younger and just starting out. It's also made me realize that some of the more unsavory moments in my career would have been classed as various types of discrimination. I've also learned things that I'll be arming myself with going forward in my career as a musician. So, Wherever you're at in your pursuit of a career or wherever you work in music, I hope that this session will be helpful. And just, just before I start to share our report findings, I want to state that while all the research material has been handled with the utmost care and sensitivity, there will be some comments shared here that could be viewed as distressing. Are we starting the slideshow? Brilliant. One of the reasons for this report was to determine whether there's been a change since the ISM's 2018 research, or if people working in the music sector are still subjected to discrimination at work. Just to say that in this report, the term discrimination is used to cover direct and indirect discrimination, harassment and victimization. So this could be anything from racism to ageism, sexual harassment, or losing out on work for having made a complaint. These terms are explained fully in the report appendix, if you fancy finding that, and scrolling to page 41. We ran an anonymous survey in May and June this year, and it received 660 responses. Participants were a self-selecting group who work across the UK music sector. So what do you think? Has there been any change since 2018? Next slide, please. Our data suggests that there has been a change and that it's not positive. 66% of survey respondents reported that they've experienced some form of discrimination at work at least once. 70% of which occurred in the past five years. This is up from 47% from our 2018 report. Our research suggests that discrimination 
is often used as a mechanism to exhibit power and control over others who are often younger, female, and trying to establish their careers in music. And so they're less likely to make a fuss. We found that 78% of discrimination was committed against women and 16% against men. 72% of incidents were committed by people with seniority or influence over their career. This is followed by 45% by a colleague or coworker and 27% by a third party, such as an audience member, client or customer. 58% was identified as sexual harassment. There'll be more on that in a moment. While levels of discrimination were high across all demographics, the people who came out as having the highest risk of being discriminated against were Black, Asian, mixed or multiple ethnicity groups, people with disabilities and women. I was really pleased that our survey reached people who work in diverse roles within the music sector. Can I have the next slide, please, Vic? The top three professions were educators, performers, and arrangers, composers, producers, songwriters. The graphic here illustrates the levels of discrimination reported through these different types of work. This includes live music crew, sound engineers, artist managers, studio assistants, session musicians, music journalists, and more. What you can see is starkly evident that there's no area of work that came out of the survey as being particularly safer to work in. Survey takers have the option to anonymously share comments about their personal experiences. The comments were analyzed to categorize the type of discrimination being described. We identified all forms of discrimination from every protected characteristic under the Equality Act 2010, apart from marriage and civil partnership. Neris, in a moment, will talk more about the Equality Act and what these protected characteristics are. Sexual harassment was by far the most common, with 58% of all comments directly relaying details of it. This was predominantly experienced by women in the survey. Some chose to share comments detailing some of the locations where this had occurred, such as on stage, in rehearsals, on tour buses, teaching in schools, at networking events, during performances, and receiving unwanted social media messages. They simply cannot escape it. Next slide. I was told as a female musician, I would only advance my career if I was prepared to give sexual favors. I've had section leaders refuse to shake my hands because I was a woman. Verbal and sexual harassment from audience members, being called pet names that my male colleagues are not. Next slide, please. In a sad way, I kind of got used to being discriminated due to being a female performer, so grew qu quite a thick skin, even if it did, did still irk me at times deep down. Which instance in a studio, on stage, backstage, everywhere? We also had someone say, I was sexually assaulted during a show run and felt unable to tell anyone as we still had three months of working together. It was one of the most difficult times for me. The majority of these women feared not being booked again if they refused to comply or complained about this behavior. Next slide. There were plenty of other types of discrimination that came through in the survey as shown in this graphic, as well as descriptions of bullying and allegations of criminal behavior. Next slide. 
derogatory comments regarding nationality, adequate adjustments to keep me in work not being made or taken seriously. I have a health condition which makes it difficult to do my job. Lewd remarks at female singers, bullying and intimidating people on stage. Next slide. Discriminated against on the basis of sexual orientation by line manager and senior management. Becoming pregnant was a joyful and stressful thing at the same time. It means I will receive fewer offers of work for the rest of my career. This is a comment I could have written my, myself being pregnant right now. Discrimination is endemic in the whole music profession. This comment sums it all up, really. Next slide. Let me remind you of the main overall stat from this survey. 660 responded and 66% said that they've experienced discrimination at work at least once. The majority were self-employed as is normal in the music profession. This often means that there's no one to go to when this, when this happens. 88% of self-employed people didn't report discrimination and 94% said it was because there was no one to tell. It didn't seem a big enough deal, didn't realize how deeply wrong it was at the time. Not reporting as I was told, it's your fault, you're a very attractive young lady, disgusting. I didn't think it would make a difference. Next slide. feeling extremely vulnerable with diminished levels of self-confidence, hard to prove anything would get a bad reputation. Without support, there are huge obstacles to making a case. Didn't want to appear difficult to work with. There were dozens more comments, all relaying the same deeply felt fears and despondency at accepting this culture as part and parcel of the already precarious nature of working in music. Our survey data suggests that incidents go unreported because the behavior is not being recognized as unlawful at the time because it's so common and therefore it's accepted as part of the culture of working in music. There are rarely any repercussions for the perpetrators. There's no HR function like in other more traditional workplaces and also because of huge power imbalances. The largely unregulated music workforce is left to suffer in silence with a culture of acceptance and fear, fear fueled by power imbalances and an inadequate legislative framework. We aren't just here to deliver bad news. <laughs> We've worked really hard to write a set of recommendations and are actually feeling fairly positive that they're going to help make meaningful change and quickly. One thing is for sure, we don't want to be publishing reports every year saying how scandalously unsafe it can be for workers, especially freelancers. Now I'm going to hand over to Vic Bain, co-author and current ISM president. She's going to talk a bit more about our research and go into some of the recommendations that we've made in the report. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was, um, yeah, so, you know, quite alarming statistics. It was quite a heavy report to, to look at over, over the summer, but very important that we do that we do find out what's what's going on for everyone who works in music. So to continue on in a little bit more more detail about the culture in the in the music industry, and you know I have described it as a as a culture of fear. So what do we mean by culture? Well, we mean the um, the ideals, the norms, the customs and the behaviors that we all accept as normal in our day-to-day -day lives working in music. It's just the way things are. It's just the way things are in music. 
But these behaviors are taught, now perhaps not consciously, but they're behaviors that are, are reproduced and we, you know, we understand or we can see that some of these issues start in our colleges and universities and conservatoires and that they then feed into the profession and, uh, and back into, into the colleges and conservatoires again. We found levels of discriminatory behaviour in uh, the ISM's Dignity in Study report, which was also published in, in 2018. So what we have here is this, this circle where discriminatory behaviour is observed during training, it's normalised, those behaviours carry on into the, into the profession, into the industry, there's no repercussions and that and that behavior then gets fed back so it's a it's a really negative loop that we are in it's just the culture here but we would argue that for too long we have accepted that uh, harassment and discrimination are part of our music culture 55 percent of the dignity at work two respondents said it's just the culture here. So what are some of the reasons and some of the factors why we are seeing these behaviors? As Catherine mentioned, we have very high levels of self-employment in the music sector. Uh, I did some ana analysis last, last year, looking at Office of National Statistics um, data on musicians, and I found that 83% of musicians over a 10-year period up until 2021, 83% of all musicians are self-employed. Now, if we compare that with 16% across all other, other sectors, so the music industry really um, suffers because we have no are not many protections for our freelance workers in the same way that we do employed workers. And I'm sure Neris will go into that in more, in more detail. Also, something we, we, um, we write about in the report are the governance structures of the industry. There are barriers to participation from women. There is a hierarchy in the music industry, which we can see in most organ organizations, and more women at the top of these organizations would be very helpful. Research, academic research shows that there is more sexual harassment in male dominated industries, and music is still very male, especially at the top of these org organizations, where quite often women can't get to the top of these um, companies because there are there were very high earning requirements, such as we see at uh, collecting societies like PRS. There's also a real lack of awareness. You know, people are shocked, I think, at the statistics, statistics we are talking about. So we need to, to keep doing research like this. We need to keep on top of the statistics and data. And there's definitely a need for more training all through the music sector so that people are aware that this is, a, this is a problem. We can make it visible, we can do something about it. There's also a real culture of victimization. Someone is brave enough to come forward with a complaint and somehow they end up being the problem. They end up being the ones who are um, considered tr troublemakers and they're pushed out. And sometimes they might not be given further opportunities again. We really need to break this cycle of blaming victims and make it safer to report. So the ISM is doing really practical things about this problem. In 2018, as a result of the first Dignity at Work report, the ISM created a sector-wide code of practice. And this is, it's, it's just a very simple one-page 
commitment for organizations across music that um, they would adhere to a set of principles that would tackle and prevent bullying and discrimination for those working in those organizations. It ensures that organizations are committed to promoting a diverse and equal working culture. And it ensures that those organizations commit to a level of good practice and that they will have processes in place for reporting of discrimination and harassment. 86% of the respondents to the, to the first Dignity at Work report called for a code of practice, called for organizations to sign up, and even more have done so at, at this Dignity at Work 2 report as well. We do have 100, about 120 organizations who have signed up to that code, but we need many, many more signing up. And we have a whole range of recommendations for government and the music sector. So I'll go through these recommendations just a, a very quickly, very high level. And I think you know what we've what we've really identified is just how vulnerable our freelancers are. We need the Equality Act 2010 to be amended so that freelancers have more rights than, um, than they do currently, which is, very, which is very little. If you're employed, you have, you have rights. If you're freelance, you, you may very well not. And we need, we need that definition expanded. We certainly need to reintroduce a couple of things as well. Unfortunately, the Conservative government uh, took away a few, a few uh, rights um, about 2012, they took away um, rights of protection around third party harassment and third party harassment basically basically means if um, someone not working for that organization, but it could be an audience member, it could be a fan. And if a musician is being harassed, uh, we, you know, we really need people in those situations, musicians in those situations protected as well. So we need, we need that put back in. We need discrimination questionnaires put back in. They were a very useful, useful tool for uh, invest, investigating if somebody brought a discrimination case. We also would like to see the time limit e extended for people to be able to, to bring cases. At the minute, it's only three months, which is just no time at all. If, somebody you know somebody is really processing a, a particular ex, you know experience negative negative um, um, discrimination or harassment and we would also very much like to see all of the recommendations that the women and equalities committee report on sexual harassment in the workplace which was published last year there was all sorts of recommendations including um, mandatory duties to protect workers from, from harassment, statutory code of practice on sexual harassment and better data collection. There was all sorts of really useful recommendations. We would like to see those adopted and also strengthening and properly funding the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which has been another government organization which has suffered from, from very severe budget cuts over the past few years. And then finally, some, you know, some very practical recommendations for the music industry as well. There's lots of membership organizations, various um, parts of the, the music industry. So the ISM looks after musicians and music professionals, but there's all sorts of other trade bodies and they can really lead the way and set a very clear example by having members codes of practice in their own organizations and advertised on their websites as well. And for music organizations to supply all workers with codes of conduct and codes of conduct which really clearly define types of discriminatory behavior. Because as we've seen from, from some of the quotes in the report, people don't or you're not always aware that they have been discriminated against because the culture makes it un unclear. And 
Also funding bodies such as the Arts Council and other trusts and foundations can, can, can really help as well. Some of these funding bodies already require um, special reporting, data reporting on diversity within their organizations. But if they were to implement a requirement for funded organizations to have regular training on this issue, alongside proper written processes and policies, that would, would be a great step forward too. And for all organizations to understand their obligations under the Equality Act, because not many, not many people know about their, their rights. Uh, at the same time, not many organizations or employers understand their responsibilities. So there's a whole raft of things we could be doing right now. And if we adopted all of these recommendations, we could really help change the culture of the music industry, taking it from being a culture of fear to being a, cult a culture of inclusion and acceptance. So that is the end of our presentation or the first part of our presentation we've now got um, a campaign dignity to work campaign we'd like everybody who's who's watching today to sign up to that and now do I do I hand back over to you Deborah yes you do um, I am reliably informed that if you just put your camera on the QR code uh, which hopefully will return to our screens that will take you to the Dignity to Work campaign page. So perhaps um, we can get that back up on the screen. There we go. And it's even bigger. So um, if you see that QR code there, I'm sure everybody can see that. Stick your camera on it and that will take you to the page where you can sign up for the Dignity to Work campaign. It's absolutely what amazing what modern technology can do. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So um, that was quite uh, tough stuff. I think we can all agree on that. Um, we know that there's a problem and Catherine showed us what that problem was in detail. And Vic then shared with us the thinking around the ISM's proposals in relation to change. Now, we have been talking to loads of organisations from funders through to government, uh, people in positions of power and influence about what they can do to take on board these various changes that we are supporting. If you are in a position of influence, if you have some kind of role around advocacy within your organization, then please do take those recommendations and talk to either your boss or if you are the boss take them on board and make sure that those recommendations become part of the work that you do and that's really important because we all have a role to play for instance back in 2018 um, and I can't believe I'm saying this four years on but back in 2018 when we saw the first load of evidence come through very similar but not as extensive I have to say as the evidence that Catherine uncovered. Um, we were shocked at the ISM. And therefore I went to the board and said, look, we have to do something. We can't just moan about this. We have to be proactive. And the board and I have a brilliant board at the ISM. They're really responsive. They've always been very responsive. Um, put in place um, a Dignity at Work code, which is within the ISM uh, member handbook which sets out very clearly what our expectations are in connection with member conduct and if member conduct falls below the standards which the board has set then there will be repercussions for the member now we're very very clear about this in our joint materials so that nobody is taken unaware and I think that's important you know if you're talking about this stuff you have to walk the walk as well you can't just talk about it so thank you to Catherine and Vic um, we're now going to move on to Neris, who is going to sketch out for us, I think. Um, workers' rights. Neris isn't feeling that great today, so <laughs> be gentle with her. Um, I know there's a lot of bugs going around, so over to you, Neris. Great, thank you. 
just need my first slide. Great. Yes, yeah, so my name is Nera Soon and I work, as Deborah said, in the legal team with the ISM. So today I'm going to highlight the legal protections that are available to musicians who find themselves at the receiving end of these sorts of behaviours that we've heard about from Catherine and Vic. What can you actually do about it? And I think maybe the key takeaway, I hope, of what I'm going to say is that if you're an ISM member, if you've got this sort of problem, you must not suffer in silence. You need to make contact with the ISM team as soon as possible. We're very nice. Do it early. The sooner you do it, the more we can help you with. So, you know, we can get in there early with you to help you back. evidence gathering, letter writing, support, all the kinds of supports you need. What is possible is always going to depend on your own individual situation. So what I'm going to say now is, is obviously in very general terms. So I just want to sketch out where the key areas of legal protection are. So first, we've got the rights under the Equality Act. We're going to come to in a, in a little minute in a few more slides. But what about the other areas that might be useful? So what about health and safety? So as Deborah said, employers must provide a safe workplace, not just for their own employees, but also for anybody else who might be affected by their work activities. And that includes being kept safe from harassment or bullying. Now, if you're an employee, and that includes an employee with a zero hour contract, you've got a basic contractual right to treat you fairly, not to be subjected to bullying and discrimination, to have your grievances properly heard and addressed and so on. Another piece of legislation quite interesting is the Protection from Harassment Act. So this is a piece of legislation which was originally designed to combat stalking, but it can be used in cases of the most serious, we're talking borderline criminal incidents of harassment at work, and it can create liability for an organisation as well as an individual. Then there's a bit of specific legislation which is called the Malicious Communications Act. Now, this is a piece of criminal law and it relates to electronic communications that are indecent, grossly offensive and so on. So this is what, uh, when we're looking at online harassment, for example, cyberbullying, doxing, which is where um, somebody puts all your personal information online in a malicious way without your permission, malicious emails and so on. Then obviously there's the general criminal law, harassment that causes you fear of violence, race, hate, crimes and so on. Then interestingly, what about whistleblowing? So whistleblowing was extremely complicated. It is always highly fact specific. But if there is an embedded culture of sexual harassment and misogyny in say an orchestra, and it's affecting multiple women, then there is a public interest in that. And whistleblowing laws might be one source of legal rights that might help members. Proper legal advice is always needed, but I'm just sketching out for you some of the areas that can be material in this, um, in this field. And the last thing to think about is of course safeguarding. Now, I'm not gonna talk about this in any detail at all, but it is the case that musicians often work in environments like churches, schools, where there are children, there are young people, there are vulnerable adults, and somebody who engages in predatory behaviour towards adult colleagues may also present a safeguarding risk for young people, and that's something that, um, that we see in the legal team and that needs thinking about. So next slide, please. Okay, so um, I'm going to focus, as I said, in the next few slides on the Equality Act. So this is an act, as we've heard, that combats discrimination in connection with a defined list of what are called the protected characteristics. So you can see them there listed on the slide. I'm not going to read them out. There's so much you could say about this. There isn't time to go into a huge amount of detail. Notice, however, that it is a defined list. So if it's not on the list, it's not protected. And it's also worth noticing, as the research we've heard about highlights, that some people in our sector are suffering from multiple forms of discrimination at the same time, for example, sex and race. So next slide, please. So this slide is showing you the main categories of protection of work under the Equality Act. But today, because I'm talking to Catherine and Vic's research and the sorts of issues we've just been heard about hearing about, I'm going to focus on only three categories, direct discrimination, harassment and victimisation. Now, direct discrimination is where you're treated less favourably because of a protected characteristic like sex. So a simplistic illustration could be that you are denied the position of principal in your section because your director thinks mothers can't be relied on because of their childcare commitment. So there he is making a stereotypical assumption about what women can do and treating you less favourably as a result. Now, that is an example of direct discrimination. But straight away, you can see the enormous problems of proof because in the real world, few people ever admit to this kind of thinking, even to themselves, and certainly not on paper. So direct discrimination is hardly ever admitted and it is often subconscious. So what we have often is 
behavior that is, as we've heard, it's buried, it's buried in um, embedded long-standing cultures of sexism, like the evidence that we've been listening to. Now, harassment, harassment is something different. And I'm gonna come on to the definition of harassment in a minute. And victimization is something different again. And this is where you're penalized for asserting your Equality Act rights or helping somebody else to do that. Next slide, please. Bear with me. Before we get on to um, looking at harassment and victimization, I want to look at who is protected by Equality Act rights. So discrimination, harassment, victimization, and so on. So we've got some relatively straightforward categories. We've got job applicants, we've got employees, including apprentices. And then there's this category, anyone, including freelancers who has a contract personally to do work. Now there are some live issues here I'm going to come on to in the next slide. But who is not protected? And this is where it gets complicated and very unsatisfactory. So shockingly, the Equality Act does not protect genuine volunteers from harassment at work. What about interns? Well, it depends whether they're working and that depends on their own individual circumstances. But it's quite shocking that there is this level of uncertainty when you have young people who are so vulnerable to sexual harassment. And then what about the genuinely self-employed? And what I mean there is people who are running their own businesses, freely operating, offering their services to their own clients and customers. Now they are unlikely to be protected because they are running a business. They are not employees, they are not workers. However, the position here is not at all straightforward. And I'm gonna come on to this in the next slide. So next slide, please. So this slide, is, is looking at what we mean by this phrase, contract personally to do work. What does that actually mean? Because as we've heard, one of the problems for many performing musicians stems from this practice of being able to send a suitable deaf of your choice to take your place at concerts. So this can potentially act as a barrier to legal protection under the Equality Act. So the idea has long been that if you are free to send someone else to do your work instead of you, then you can't be under a contract personally to do work. Now, why is that? Because you can send someone else, so you're not obliged personally to do it. So that means theoretically that you're not protected by the Equality Act, even in relation to something as basic as protection from sexual harassment. Now, manifestly, that is completely unacceptable, but it is important not to jump to conclusions or to be too pessimistic because as I said, everybody's situation is unique. So we need to look at everybody. In other words, if you have a problem, you should come and see us. You should never assume that you are self-employed and therefore have no protection and so on, come and see us. And the other point I wanted to make is that case law is developing in very important ways. This is a very fluid area. So in particular, we had the landmark Uber ruling in the Supreme Court in early, in early 2021. Now, this is so important because what the Supreme Court said is that what matters when you're deciding whether someone should be entitled to statutory employment rights, and that includes rights under the Equality Act, is whether Parliament intended a group of vulnerable people to be given those rights. Now, freelance musicians who are integrated into an orchestra, say, are manifestly vulnerable to the threat of sexual harassment, and surely Parliament must have intended them to be entitled to this protection, even if they have a contractual right to send a deputy to take their place. So you can see the movement in, in the courts is in, in our direction. And also, post Uber, there has been a new binding discrimination ruling, very interesting this year, involving dental locums. I put a, 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 a on the slide the name of the case, Sedgeball against Roderick Dental Limited. Now, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail here, but what I want to point out is that this case is suggesting that even if your contract gives you a genuine free right to send a deputy of your choice, it can be enough for the purpose of showing you have a contract, remember those keywords, personally to do work, that on a realistic assessment of what's been agreed between you and the other party, you can show you are obliged to do some work personally, some work personally. In other words, you're obliged to do some performances, but you can send it to a deputy to do other performances. That may be nowadays enough personal service, according to this new Sedgeville case, for you to get some Equality Act rights. So this is a far more realistic approach that is good news for our members. So you can see there that the courts are moving in our direction. And the last point I want to make on this is to remember, as I flagged up at the start, whistleblowing are very complicated, but 
whistleblowing law uses a wider definition of a worker, doesn't always insist on a contract personally to do work. So the takeaway point from all of this, as I said, is that every case is different. So yes, there are big strategic problems in the sector, but when it comes to you and your own personal problem, please contact the ISM legal team. If you've got a problem, do not assume that there's nothing that can be done for you. So next slide, please. Okay, so this next slide, I'm going to look at the definition. I said we come back to this. So what is harassment under the Equality Act? So harassment is, and this is the statutory definition, any unwanted conduct relating to one of the protected characteristics we saw on that slide that has the purpose or effect of violating your dignity, I'm quoting now, or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment. So what are examples? Well, we've heard a lot of examples, haven't we? But you could, it could be abusive language. Could be name calling, jokes, offensive emails, nasty sexism, text, cruel social media posts. We've heard many examples, but there's, you know, the act is interesting because it can be harassment if you have to watch others being subjected to harassing behavior, even if you're not the target of the harassment, or if you are the person who has to put up with a generalized, misogynist, horrible environment, even if offensive comments are not targeted at anybody, it can be just the climate you have to work in can amount to harassment for the purpose of the equality act. Now, I'm not suggesting this is easy, but there we are. That is how the law uh, works. Now, another type of harassment, which is specifically contained in the equality act is unwanted conduct of a sexual nature. So what does that mean? Well, it's all kinds of conduct can range from sexually, casual emails to serious sexual assaults. And the last category, which we have heard about, haven't we, is where you're penalized at work. For example, you're denied performing opportunities because you're either, you either rejected or you submitted to somebody else's unwanted sexual advances. Now that can be anybody else's sexual advances. It doesn't have to be somebody you're contracted to work for. And lastly, this is an important point, whether your harasser's behavior violates your dignity or causes you to feel humiliated, intimidated and so on, depends predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly, mainly on your own subjective perception of the experience, how it makes you feel. So next slide, please. So the next slide, my next slide is about victimization. I'm not going to go into it in great detail because you can see it on the slide. I just want to point out victimization in this context has a very specific meaning. It is where you are penalized because you asserted equality act rights. For example, because you made a complaint about discrimination or because you supported somebody else's complaint. So next slide, please. So yeah. This is an interesting slide, I think, because it is important to remember the potency of the Equality Act. Now, I could go on about this in great detail, but I just want to point out that it is a very powerful act for all its faults. So an employment tribunal can find a harasser personally liable for acts of harassment to work. That is to say, to their own personal assets. That is their risk, uh, quite apart from the fact that they lose their job and their position and so on. In addition, and alongside the individual, employers are liable for all harassment, discrimination, or victimization by employees in the course of their employment. Now, I know we've got a discussion about whether you're an employee or not, but let's just look at the, what the standard is here, because um, this is this is this is what is telling organisations the standard they have to reach for everybody effectively, and so it's. So it's um, in the course of, unless the employer can prove, and this is what's important, that before the incident took place, they took all reasonable steps to stop this kind of incident happening in the first place. So it doesn't matter whether the employer knew or approved of the harassment behavior. The employer is going to be liable, even if they had no idea it was happening, unless they can show that they already had taken all reasonable steps to stop this kind of behaviour. So why is that important to freelancers and everyone else who's in the workplace, even if they're not an employee? Well, it's because the Equality Act is designed to prevent discrimination and harassment happening to anybody in the workplace. And it does that by very strongly incentivizing organisations to have a zero tolerance approach to all forms of discrimination because of the fear of being targeted by a legal claim. That is how the act is supposed to work. Now, there's lots that you could say about what reasonable steps are and so on, but I don't have time to go into that now. 
Um, so instead, if we can have the next slide, please. I'm going to talk about some practical steps. So what practical steps can you take? So I think the first point to make, and we've sort of got this, haven't we, from, from the presentations we've heard already, is confide in somebody you trust. You need to recognise that this is a traumatic issue. So there's going to be a link in the chat to some of the sources of mental health support that are available to you, but you must get help. So as I said at the start, contact the ISM team, don't delay. Deadlines are very short in the Employment Tribunal, but don't delay anyway, because even if you're not going to litigate, you know, there's still things that can be done. So keep a good journal. This is very important. Give a record of all the incidents. Note down precise words as soon as possible after you hear them. Be accurate. Don't exaggerate. Try not to paraphrase things inaccurately, because if you change your account later on, it can be seized on to suggest you aren't telling the truth. So you have to remain consistent. Record dates, times, contexts, all this information. Now keep copies of emails, screenshots, messages, online posts, photographs, etc. It sounds very stressful. It is stressful. Is there a confidential reporting or bullying and harassment procedure where you work? Well, there might be. We know lots of ISM members operate in environments where there's no HR. But in any event, you know, go to somebody you can trust. Come to us first if you're in a, in a situation where you don't know where to go. Seek out, as I said, mental health support. For example, there's the ISM Counseling Helpline. You go to your GP and so on and add this to your record of what's happening to you because it may turn out to be important. You may need to be able to demonstrate this is what you've known. And do you need to contact the police? In the worst scenarios, you may be in that situation. There are expert charities out there that can help you. There's Rape Crisis, for example, or there's the Survivors Trust. I know there's lots of information about these sorts of um, organisations in our report. So the last, my last slide, please, is just to say, as I have said all the way through this, that everybody's experience is different. Everybody's experience is going to be highly personal. So if you've got a problem and you're an ISM member, get in touch with the legal team as soon as possible. Member, part of your ISM membership, gets access to the legal team and the legal expenses insurance if, if you qualify, and that gives members support in taking claims in areas like discrimination, harassment and victimisation. So that is all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neris. Um, I hope we haven't confused too many of you with that um, quick canter through employment yeah. legislation. Um, I, I speak as an employment solicitor myself. It is incredibly complicated. And sometimes you don't know what rights you have. You just don't. Why would you? Um, and it's not like buying a jumper in the shop that suddenly falls apart in the washing machine and you can go back to uh, Marks and Spencers and say, I want my money back. It's not it's not simple like that. Uh, workplaces are never simple. So um, do exactly what Neris said. She's an absolutely fantastic employment lawyer and uh, just brilliant to work with. So hopefully people have now got some questions. We're going to run on a bit later because um, there is so much to cover. So I hope you can all bear with us and keep with us until... 6.15. I hope that's all okay because we've got lots and lots of questions that have already come in and I'm sure there will be some in the chat as well. So um, I'm just going to go, so I've got my other computer over here, so multi multitasking at the moment. Um, the first one I want to ask is how can we demand justice from employers who are discriminating against staff with long-term health issues? Now, that immediately takes us into two different areas of the law. Um, and it's complicated because it always is with employment law. I'm going to ask Neris for her thoughts on this. Okay, well... I think you need to go to the Equality Act, don't you? Because there, it, you know, it has some very valuable protections for disabled workers. It has the duty to make reasonable adjustments, which is actually a very powerful tool available um, to help people carry on doing their job. Um, the law is there. It's a question of making sure people know it's there and making and making sure it gets enforced. Now, in the ISM legal team, we have represented 
several peris during and after the pandemic who have been struggling with long-term health conditions. So people who are clinically extremely vulnerable or people with long COVID. So everyone's position is different. So if, you know, if whoever's put in this question has a specific problem, please come and see, you could get in touch with us and we can see how we can help them. I think the only thing I would add to that is that it may not be that you will fall within the definition of disabled. So that's the only other thing I would add. You might come within a different bit of the employment law structure, which is to do with capacity. And um, employers can let go somebody who they feel lacks capacity, provided they take certain steps. And that's where process becomes incredibly important. But for the employer, they are then taking the risk that the claimant will say, no, 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 it's not lacking capacity. I actually have a disability. So it's um, it's complicated. It's complicated. We don't deny that. Um, just wondering if we have any more questions coming in from those attending. I hope everyone's uh, not finding this too hard going on a Wednesday evening. Um, I feel a bit like Chris Mason, um, who does the BBC podcast, you know, newscast. We've got resilience if you're still with us. Um, on to another question. I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask Catherine this. And I think this is a difficult question, actually, Catherine. Uh, so what role do you think codes of practice play in the prevention of bullying and harassment? against freelance workers and your eyebrows have shot up there. I think it's a different, difficult question. What do you think? Do you think codes of practice can have a, an impact on, on freelancers? Well, yes, that is a difficult yeah. question for sure. Um, I think that having, well, I am currently a freelancer and I have been for over 10 years. I have never been distributed a code of practice by anybody I've ever worked for. So they very may well have one. They might have even signed up to the ISM code of practice, but I've never been made aware of what to do when going into an orchestra, say, or giving a recital anywhere. So, um, and I don't think any of my colleagues have either. So, um, but that's one reason why I'm so passionate about doing this work, which is I know that um, it doesn't filter down. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It doesn't it doesn't get through to the people turning up and doing the work. Um, and so I'm really hopeful that with 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 my experience um, being on the front line, as it were, uh, we can find ways that there can be written policies that get sent out to everybody engaged on the work, whether they've received funding or they receive funding and then they engage a freelancer to get a little bit of that project with them. Everybody needs to know, everybody needs these definitions and uh, there needs to be a port of call to go to when something wrong happens. I'm gonna ask Vic what her thoughts are in relation to shifting culture, because really this is a question of whether codes can shift culture or whether other things are needed as well to shift culture. Well, I think I think awareness is a key a key thing. So that's why this report is so valuable because even even though it's quite um, grim findings, at least we are all having a discussion about mm -hmm. it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's a very important first first step. But then then employers and organizations need to commit to um, regular training and awareness. And it's no good saying, well, well, I think we did some training five years ago because staff turnover and, 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 and so on is, um, can, be, can be very fluid. So the organizations need to commit to regular training. And that you know, should involve a, a wide range of focuses really, rights and responsibilities. But, di but different different areas of diversity and and inclusion. So I think you know it, it's a learning journey for everyone. Um, and some people really do need codes to understand what is and what isn't acceptable, because because our culture is so is so murky. So I think more more 
more data and, and research or regular data and research, regular training that everybody commits to, um, and a, a real commitment from the leaders in the music industry to set a better ex example because the cultures, cultures in organizations and in sectors are, are set from the people at the top. I think it's a really difficult question, this one. I really do. I, I totally agree with Vic around culture coming from the top. But in the music sector, it's a very transient workforce. Um, many people, even if they're employed, they're on zero hour contracts. A lot of gigging musicians are in lots of different types of bands. So I always ask myself about a wedding band. A wedding band turns up, plays music at a wedding, then moves on again. What happens there in relation to third party harassment? So that's, say, a guest at the wedding harassing. What happens if a band member harasses? You've got four people in the band. We obviously don't have an HR function. They won't have done any training. Um, there certainly won't be a code. So how does how does that work in terms of shifting behavior? And I guess I'm, I kind of think back to my days as a solicitor in the tribunal, and I took a lot of cases in the tribunal. I think one of the merits of tribunal cases is they make others stop and think. If you end up in court, that will go through the sector, a small sector like ours, and people will think to themselves, I better not do that, I might get caught. Um, and it's as basic as that, it's not sophisticated. So I think we need lots of different uh, ways of interacting and intervening in order to shift culture. I don't think there's one magic bullet at all. Um, I'm gonna ask you a different question. Um, I'm gonna ask Neris this question. Um, what do you do, and I think this is a, another tricky question, what do you do if you see someone else being harassed, discriminated against, or bullied. So it's a third party case here, really. Well, um, you should feel comfortable to report it, but it's your choice in the end, you know, whether you actually do anything, isn't it? It's your choice. You should follow whatever procedures in place if you want to do that. Um, um, should you have things a like this? Should you have a conversation with the person who you are seeing is coming, you know, is having a bad time of things? I mean, should you say to them, well, actually, that isn't acceptable what's happening to you? Well, that, well, absolutely that you should do that. You, oh, well, it's up to you, obviously, what, what, what you do. But one of the things you can do is obviously offer solidarity and support to that person. Um, Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and the other point uh, is there can be sort of safety numbers, can't there, in this mm -hmm. kind of issue, in that uh, you might not be the only person who's seen it. Mm -hmm. um, so you might want to, um, you know, get together and raise it as a group. You might want to get together and raise it anonymously as a group. Yeah. Um, because the other thing to do is if you do help report this kind of incident, then you're creating a record, or even if nothing else happens, you're creating a record. And then the more small incidents in relation to a perpetrator that are built up over time, then each separate one starts to build a, a wider picture of what's actually happening. And that can be enormously valuable. Um, so obviously, it, you know, if you if if you can, it's a good idea to to participate and to go and and um, and report it, and certainly it's a good idea to um, support the person who is in in difficulty. In the end, it's always up to you, but I mean that's you know that's the best thing um, to do. And the other thing is, as I mean, it's a theoretical point in a way, but as I said in the presentation, you know, you experiencing harassment, uh, watching it is in and of itself potentially an act of harassment of you, depending on how it makes you feel. Um, so, it, so it's complicated, but I mean, I think the main issue is um, to sort of ask yourself what kind of organization you want to be working in and to feel comfortable and safe actually doing something about it. Do you feel comfortable and safe? 
supporting supporting coming out and being helpful one hopes you do I think I think there's also something about the type of organization you're working for um, if it's a fairly ramshackle organization without an HR department um, that record keeping may not be brilliant if it's a sophisticated organization where there is a really good HR department um, then I think there's a real reason for reporting and this is totally practical it's the nature of HR departments which differ tremendously between employers. Some of them are very good, some of them are not very good, just the nature of them. Um, I'm going to ask another question now, um, which uh, is a tricky one. Um, are women being misrepresented and objectified <coughs> as a means of exploitation within the music industry? Where to start with that? I think I'm going to give this one to Vic. What are your thoughts? Uh, yes, and it and it has been ever thus. Sadly, if we if we look at the history of um, women women in music, and the um, the very low regard actually uh, female performers um, were he were held in certainly up until the Victorian times, if they were allowed on stage at all. Um, uh, because many, most were not, and so you know, so women coming into the music industry has been has been quite a um, you know quite a late d d development, and women are very much seen as um, well. I think there's a terminology from the jazz world: women re women are referred to as the canaries, you know, the brightly coloured birds at the front of the stage and all of their beautiful plumage. So that that is a, a, a problem, you, you know, because we are seen and judged on how we look, rather than how good a musician uh, we are for the for the skills and experience that we that we have. So that's something that needs constantly challenging. But I think it does permeate permeate the music industry culture as well. So there's lots and lots of research around this, and I do I do think those of uh, those stereotypes um, in infiltrate our music culture. Mm -hmm. Very interesting observation there. I'm going to take one more question from our list. Um, and this one I'm going to ask uh, Catherine uh, about. Um, so this is really going back to the research. How many respondents were employees of a music industry organization? And do you have any comment on the findings in organisational settings? Now, that's quite a complicated question, and, and you may not have any comments on the organisational part, although organisational um, behaviours within industries are incredibly interesting. And I know Vic has done quite a lot of research on this. So organisational psychology is something that I might throw over to Vic, but let's start with Catherine. And how many respondents were employees of a music industry organization? Sure. Well, as as far as I can um, get get back into the data, I can say that thirty three respondents were um, said that they were employed, and <clears throat> by employment, as in music, that could mean so many different things. But we we did have a number of cat like broad categories, so they could have been say professional ensemble assistants or orchestra managers or um, work in music publishing or um, or uh, an employed educator. We did find that there were slightly higher levels of reporting by people who were employed and there were slightly more um, positive outcomes for reporting. Um, there's all, all of this information in either the appendix of the report from page 41 onwards or in the um, section. I've got a lovely printed copy so you can see it uh, here, uh, which is very nice to flip through um, that, that, that breaks it down a little bit more of the outcomes from reporting officially. So if, if, if the person who asked the question wants more 
data we can talk more percentages do let me know <laughs> yes and Catherine does like her percentages so I do she's, uh, <laughs> she's very good at them thanks um, any thoughts from you Vic on the organizational psychology aspect of what we found well, organisations, you know, do take on their or their own or develop their own cultures very often, as as I uh, said previously. You, those cultures are set from from the top, from the from the founder, the leader, or the the the, the senior management. However, there are not many large organisations in the music industry. I think it's something like ninety two percent um of companies in music um or less than 10 people so if the you know um if if we're talk if we're talking about most organizations in music they're micro bis businesses so yes they still they still have their own their own um cultures their own norms ways of, of behaving and what is what is acceptable and that will usually come from 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 the leaders who are who are vastly majoritively male Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important point and takes us back to the founding of the ISM, which is a rather unusual organisation. Uh, ISM was set up in 1882 to do two things, to promote music and to support musicians. We were set up, as I said, in 1882. Now, an awful lot of uh, organisations at that time in music we're not allowing women in as members. I'm not going to mention names, but not all music organizations allowed women as members. ISM uh, within two years had admitted women as full members. And our archives show some of the very first conferences the ISM had with loads of women attending with splendid feather hats and feather boas. And they are an absolute picture to behold we are still a majority female membership, which is really interesting. 60% female, 40% male. Uh, we have um, absolute equality in relation to gender on the board, which is very important to us. And uh, we have a senior leadership team um, where we do have one male and we have three females. Now, that doesn't mean we're perfect. We're absolutely not perfect. We're learning all the time but we hope that we can be a force for change across many issues, not just diversity, but also music education and everything that matters to musicians at the moment, stuff like cost of living, uh, energy crisis and Brexit. So we're campaigning across a whole range of issues. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and hand back to Ruth. Thank you very much, Deborah, and thank you to everyone for bearing with us and apologies for going slightly over time. Um, but thank you very much to our speakers as well, to Deborah, to Catherine, to Vic and to Neris for presenting today and to all of our attendees for joining us. It was a difficult topic, but I hope you found the session informative and useful. Um, there is a link in the chat with more information on how our legal team can help you if you're an ISM member. And as Nara said, please do get in touch with us um, if you have any questions around your rights in relation to discrimination. Um, the recording of this webinar will be made available shortly on our website at ismtrust.org forward slash webinars. And our website also has a range of previous webinars available to view on demand, along with resources to support you, many of which are available for free. And if you want to find out about upcoming ISM Trust events, as well as news from the ISM, you can sign up to our monthly newsletter, which you can find via the link in the chat. So lastly, I just want to say thank you very much again for watching, and we hope to see you at another ISM Trust event soon. Goodbye.